Good evening, everyone. Yeah, I know it's evening. It's actually Monday evening. We had a little bit of technical difficulties yesterday with the recording. And uh, so I decided to come in today and re-record it, but it's my mom's birthday. So I decided it was probably more important to go to lunch with mom and dad than it was to come here and record. So it's now uh, Monday evening, about seven o'clock. And I want to welcome you to our worship service from yesterday. <laughs> my name is Pastor Dan, and I am the pastor here at Rexmont EC Church in Rexmont, Pennsylvania, the southern end of beautiful Lebanon County. Today, we are going to begin a new seven-week ser sermon series on focusing on who Jesus is. There are a lot of ways that uh, the Bible answers this question, who is Jesus? And for this series, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at seven key statements that Jesus makes about himself that are recorded in the Gospel of John. And we, we call these statements the I am statements of Jesus. God first used that phrase, I am, back in uh, Exodus chapter 3 when he was discussing with Moses um, about uh, Moses going back to Egypt to free the God's people from slavery. And uh, Moses asked God, who are you? And God said, I am. And that is a, a pivotal moment in, in redemptive history. God reveals himself to his people and comes to redeem them out of exile from Egypt and lead them into a new life, eventually in the promised land. God's name kind of discloses who he is and what he's like. He is the I am the eternal, unchanging, self-existent one, infinite and, and glorious in every way, and above all things and created all things. He is God. And that's what God means when he says, I am. When Jesus then takes that same phrase and applies it to himself, he is claiming to be God. In John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. He uses that same phrase. He's not a helper to God or, or just a great teacher, but he is the divine, infinite, perfect God. He's Israel's God. He has life in himself and he gives us life. The Jewish people that heard Jesus say that knew exactly what he was saying. They knew he was claiming to be God. And to them, that was blasphemy. And so John chapter 8, verse 59, the very next verse, the Bible says the, the, the Jewish people around him picked up stones and were ready to stone Jesus. But he escaped from them out of the temple and went away. There are seven I am statements in uh, the book of John. Uh, the one we're going to be looking at today is called the bread of life. I, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. They, these seven I am statements in John are, are best understood as kind of echoing this ultimate claim of Jesus that he is God. The whole Old Testament and, and all of God's redemptive acts in the Old Testament are all pointing to the coming of Jesus as God with us, and the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies. Uh, one thing to think about this series, if you're curious about who Jesus is, you, and if you ask, who, who are you? He gives seven answers to that. And we're going to look at each one of those seven answers. Who are you? I am the bread of life. Who are you? I am the light of the world. Who are you? I am the gate for the sheep. Who are you? I'm the good shepherd. Uh, we'll spend the next seven weeks trying to understand these answers, uh, these I am statements, uh, concluding on Easter Sunday morning when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. What a powerful statement that win is. Like I said, we're going to begin this morning with the first statement, I am the bread of life. 
And let me set some background for you just a little bit. Jesus is in the middle of his ministry. He's been gathering disciples. He's been teaching crowds. He's been performing signs. And, and, and when, when I say he's been performing signs, that's what the gospel of John calls him. When John was writing his gospel, he uses that phrase signs because to him, the miracles that, that Jesus performed that John writes about, and there are a bunch of them, he calls them signs. He doesn't really call them miracles. He calls them signs because they point to who Jesus is. Signs are public and there's there's supernatural acts performed by Jesus himself that that show Jesus glory to the disciples and to the crowds around him. They're designed to bring about faith in Jesus as the Son of God. And John doesn't want to miss I want us to miss them. And so he specifically points them out and identifies him them as signs. He says, this is the first sign. In fact, the first sign that he says was when Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding. And we talked about that sign uh, at the beginning of January this year when we looked at some of the miracles. Uh, the second sign that John points out is the healing of, of an official's son. And uh, if you were in Sunday school last week, we talked about that particular episode last week in Sunday school. Um, in John chapter five, the third sign is he healed the paralytic. The fourth sign, he, he fed 5,000 people. Actually, the Bible says 5,000 men. And then there were women and children on top of that. He took a little boy's lunch and fed 15 to 20,000 people. That's a sign that points us to who God is, to who Jesus is. These signs confirm his identity as the one sent by God. And when, when Jesus performed like uh, the, the turning the, the, the loaves and fish, into bread. John chapter 6 verse 14 says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is a prophet who has come into the world. They started to begin to understand who Jesus was. And because they are so amazed with him, they want to force him to become king. So actually Jesus leaves them and he withdraws into a solitary place, it says, and spends time in prayer. Uh, Jesus, because he wanted to spend a little bit of time alone, told his disciples to go into a boat and sail across the, the Sea of Galilee, and he would join them later. And later that evening, a storm sprung up, and, and the disciples were out on the boat, and they were afraid that they were going to get destroyed by these huge waves. And suddenly, Jesus comes walking across the water to them. And Peter is, all the disciples are terrified, but Peter is really terrified. But, but he turns and he calls out, he says, Jesus, if that's you, let me come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And Peter gets out of the boat <laughs> and starts to walk across the water. And then it says he, he notices the wind and the waves and he starts to sink and he calls out, God, Jesus, save me. And Jesus reaches out his hand and grabs him. And they make it to the other side of the sea. We talked about that, uh, that story a couple of weeks ago as well. Uh, the next day, this is what uh, our, our story is taking place today. The day before, he had, he had fed the 5,000. That night, he had uh, walked on water. And the next day, the people realized Jesus isn't where he was on the other side of the sea. And the, the Bible says they start to seek Jesus. And that brings us to our, our present passage. In life, there are big five things. When I, I grew up in Africa, I spent many years as a missionary in Africa. Whenever we would go to a game park, we would always try and take the people, uh, take the tourists out and see if we could see the big five animals, lion, leopard, rhino, the Cape buffalo, and of course, the biggest of the big five, the elephant. Sometimes we'd see them, sometimes we didn't. Leopards are notoriously hard to find. In life, there are, are, are big five questions that people ask. 
uh, tie in with that. And I think the big five questions that everyone wants to answer, the first question is the, the question of origin. Where have I come from? Uh, the question of destiny, where am I going? Uh, the question of, of, of identity, who am I? The, the question of meaning, what is the purpose of life? Uh, and, and the question of ethics, how should I live? And, and when we don't have answers to these five questions, we are left spiritually hungry. And Jesus says that he is the answer to all of them. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. We will have these answers when we come to Jesus and seek him out. It's a wonderful promise. During the French Revolution, uh, when the mobs of Paris were rioting and demonstrating outside the palace of, of Queen Marie Antoinette, uh, protesting the, the poverty in which they lived in, uh, the queen inquired of her courtiers, what was the trouble and they said to her, they have no bread to eat. And Marie Antoinette is remembered for her quite hard-hearted and indifferent reply. Well, then let them eat cake. She didn't understand the bread of life. This story that were taking place, sorry, the crowds that uh, talked to Jesus uh, figured out that uh, Jesus had probably headed home. And he was living in Capernaum at the time, a town on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and and they, so they went there and they found Jesus. And kind of puzzled by how they get there, the first thing they ask him is, Rabbi, when did you get here? It's clear their question didn't only mean when did you get here, but how did you get here? Because yesterday you were over there, and today you were over here, and you didn't have a boat to get on. They didn't realize and, or know that he had walked down on the water to the disciples. Uh, so they were kind of confused. Uh, and Jesus in verse uh, uh, first uh, in John chapter six, verse 26 says, very truly, I tell you. And I love that phrase. Very truly, I tell you, whenever Jesus uses that phrase, very truly, I tell you, it's a it's a phrase he uses to to kind of underscore the importance of what he is about to say. Uh, it's kind of like when you're in school and uh, the teacher says, listen up, this is going to be important. It's on going to be on the test. Very truly, I tell you, pay attention. That's what Jesus is saying. Pay attention. Listen up. It's important. In other words, Jesus knows what the people are after. They're not seeking him because they saw this public supernatural act of him feeding 5,000 people that kind of showed his glory and it called forth faith in them. They're seeking them because he fed them and, and they want more bread. They saw the sign, the miracle that he performed, but unfortunately they didn't, they didn't really see the sign. They didn't see what the sign signified. All they see is this guy can multiply bread and if they stay with him, they'll never go hungry again. They'll always have full bellies. Verse 26, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because, because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Jesus is saying, you don't want me for the right reasons. You came not because you understood I was the Messiah, but because you want another free meal. Jesus says, you worked hard to find me. You went through a lot of effort in order to get across the, the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum where I'm here. But it's just for another free lunch. And Jesus says, don't, don't work for food that perishes and rots and gets moldy. Work for food that lasts, that remains, that Jesus is going to give them. Verse 28, they ask him, what do we... What must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And so they asked him, what sign then will you give him that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? I find that amazing. They just seen in the day before feed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. And they say, well, what are you going to do for me today? That was yesterday. What are you going to do for me today? It's very clear that these people did not really understand who Jesus was, what he was doing, what he was saying to them. 
I'm reminded of a, a man who wore a button on his lapel inscribed back, B-A-I-K. Asked what those letters stood for, the man said. It's, they stand for, boy, am I confused. <laughs> of course, he was reminded that confused is spelled with a C, not with a K. And he says, well, that just goes to show how confused I really am. You know, I think this crowd is really confused as well. They really don't understand who Jesus is. And note that, that Jesus corrects them about their confusion. And he says, don't, don't work for food that spoils. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, and Jesus is not saying, don't work for a living. Uh, you know, we're not saying, you know, just stop working, go on food, on, on welfare or, or anything like that. Uh, food is important. It's a necessity for life. And you, and you, you kind of have to earn it. But don't let that be the sole reason for your working. Rather, work for the food which will give you eternal life. These people, like, like many today, unfortunately, clearly felt the most important thing in life was staying alive, to be healthy, to be strong, to be economically sufficient. And that's what life was all about, they, they thought. Unfortunately, that seems to be the majority view of people today all over the world. And I think the, the thing that makes us as humans different from animals is that we know that if we have a full belly in a comfortable place, that doesn't completely satisfy us. We're not satisfied with just a roof over our head and a good meal. Just this past Thursday, last week, there was an article in the news about billionaire financer and investor Thomas H. Lee, who was found dead in his Manhattan apartment. Lee was worth approximately $2.5 billion at the time of his death. He left behind a legacy of success, of philanthropy, giving to others success, philanthropy, every outward appearance of having won the game of life. And on Thursday, he chose to put a gun to his head and end his own life. He had worked his whole life for food that spoils and didn't have the food that brings eternal life. Barbara Walters, the, the, the TV personality, a news reporter, loved to interview famous people to try and find out what made them tick. There are three celebrities that I, I enjoyed watching their interviews with Barbara Walters. The, the, these three celebrities, their, their worldview was on display during their interviews. Um, she interviewed Johnny Carson, Walter Cronkite, and Johnny Cash. Johnny Carson uh, came across as the, the typical playboy, jaded hedonist. Everything he said and everything he did and his body language, language telegraphed the fact that he was living for pleasure. And, but, but he admitted he'd tried just about everything and been everywhere and was pretty much fed up with the whole thing. Walter Cronkite, there in the center of your picture, was the suave humanist, the worldly philosopher. He, by then, he had been retired and was wealthy. He was enjoying life as best he could. He was looking at life rather philosophically, but all he really was saying was, it is what it is. It's the way it is. Johnny Cash, on the right, on the other hand, admitted his background of alcoholism, and drug addiction, and the fact that he'd virtually destroyed his marriage and wrecked his life. But he openly said that he had found Jesus. There was a, a peace in his eyes and a contentment in his voice. Cash spoke of a hope for the future, which neither of the others had. Johnny Cash made it very clear that he had found what Jesus was talking about right here in the Gospel of John, the bread of life bread that lasts beyond mere satisfaction of physical hunger. The people around Jesus that day were mistaken about who Jesus was. They thought he was just another prophet. To them, he was a new Moses, maybe a godly man, a great teacher, sure, but nothing more than that. They thought he was a man who God would use to, to deliver the nation from the Romans, a, a man who would feed their bellies and 
keep them satisfied and happy. But they were mistaken about God's will for them, as many are today. When they realized that Jesus was talking about something other than physical bread, they asked him, what, what must we do to do the work of God that God requires? They said, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, this story about man in the wilderness is a reference to the story in the Old Testament from Exodus chapter 16. God rescues the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, and as after he did so, they were out in the desert, and, and the people started to grumble and complain. We're starving. If only we'd stayed in Egypt. Can't imagine they would rather be in slavery in Egypt than freed. But that's what they were saying. We're, we're, we, if we had food in Egypt out here in the desert, we're going to die. And so God so graciously provided them with food. Every day they would wake up and, and there would be this bread-like substance on the ground. They could gather it up, but it, they could only gather for one day. If they tried to store it overnight, it would start to breed worms and, and really stink. And the, that, was, that was bread that was that was perished and, and rotted. They had to trust God every day that he would provide them more. They called that food manna, which is just a, a Hebrew phrase meaning, what is it? Um, it's, it's so you come out of your tent and there's food on the ground and you're not sure what it is, but you eat it and it tastes okay. And so you name it, whatchamacallit. I don't know. It's, it's whatchamacallit. What is it? I don't know. Uh, the point is, God provided bread from heaven to his people in the wilderness. Jesus shows up and multiplies bread for the people. And, and the people are thinking, yeah, lunchtime. I knew Moses. He, God gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus, you give us bread from heaven to eat. And verse 32 to 34, Jesus corrects them. Very truly, I tell you, there's that phrase again. It's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. The people are fixated with their bellies, their natural appetite. And Jesus is trying to, to show them a different kind of bread. He's trying to take them deeper, deeper. They're saying, give us bread like Moses did. And Jesus says, Moses didn't give it to you, God did. And he wants to give you true bread from heaven, which is the person who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. But they're not getting it. And so they say, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just give us this bread. And then he gets very, very explicit and very clear in John chapter 6, starting in verse 35. And that's our passage for today and through verse 40. Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Verse 40, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up on that last day. So that's the story of, of Jesus and this crowd. And what I want to do with the remaining of our remainder of our time is to draw out some implications of this story for us. That's what happened back then. What's the significance for us today? Um, and, and I think the, the implications that I'm going to draw out today actually kind of, kind of are banner over all of the, the, the next seven-week series that we're going to do. Each week, we're going to look at one of the different I am statements, but we need to understand the significance of these metaphors. Uh, the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, good shepherd, etc. Here's what they tell us. The first thing I think that's so important is that reality is designed by God to reveal Jesus. God has designed the entire universe 
to reveal the person of Jesus. Long before we existed, long before Jesus came into the world, before the Bible was written down from the very beginning, I think God invented something called hunger and something called bread. And he didn't do that just because he wanted to do that. He did it because so he wanted someday when Jesus showed up to say, I am the bread of life. And we'd understand what he meant. He's not finding or discovering a convenient metaphor. He reveal, he's revealing the reason why bread even exists. Every growling stomach, every empty belly, every hearty meal, every satisfied hunger in the history of the world has led us to the moment when Jesus shows up and people says, who are you? And he says, I am the bread of life. God doesn't just discover and use analogies. He designs them. He built them into the fabric of the world so that he can reveal Jesus to us. And that's true of our universal experience of hunger. And that's true of Israel's history. Why did God give his people manna in the wilderness? To feed them? Well, yes. To keep them alive in the desert? Yes. But, but ultimately, he gave them bread from heaven so that one day Jesus could say, I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. That story points to me. And before moving on, let me just underscore everything I think in reality, everything in history is like that. It points to who Jesus is. There's something in um, the study of who God is called the argument from desire. And I'm going to press into this metaphor to, to kind of bring out what this means. Uh, Jesus is drawing a, a connection between our universal experience of physical hunger and our universal experience of spiritual hunger. All of us have been hungry and all of us have eaten food to satisfy that hunger. All of us have a spiritual hunger and all of us have tried desperately to satisfy it. Now that, that universal experience of longing of spiritual hunger is a is an argument for god's existence c.s lewis is the one that that calls it this argument from desire and here's what here's what c.s lewis writes about it he says the christian says creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction of those desires exist a baby feels hunger and there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. If I find myself a desire, and there is no experience in this world that can satisfy that desire, it, the most probable explanation is that I was made for a different world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it that doesn't prove the the universe is a fraud earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy our spiritual desire but only to bring it out to suggest the real thing every human being experiences this longing this ache this desire for what is it <laughs> We're fundamentally, as, as people, we're fundamentally desiring beings. We want to be happy and full and satisfied. There's a want, there's a hunger, a homesickness at the core of who we are. And we're always searching and searching and searching for the object of this desire. And Bono of the rock group U2 speaks for many when he says, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. The very existence of this desire is a, a testimony to the existence of God, just as the fact of physical hunger testifies that we come from a, a race that repairs itself, its body by eating and, and inhabit a world where eating substances exist. Blaise Pascal, the, the French mathematician, physicist, inventor, philosopher, and writer wrote, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the hearts of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus Christ. 
many of so many of us are trying to fill that god-shaped hole with things that end up causing us to feel even more empty and unhappy and it's only jesus that can fill that gap his message is relevant to everyone and meets the basic needs of every human being in the gospel of john i find how jesus identifies himself very interesting he says very clearly he is the bread of life there's nothing like the first time we encounter jesus he's a source of refreshment he fills our soul with joy he relieves us from the feelings of dissatisfaction caused by the vanities of this world he grants to our heart rest and peace that that surpasses all understanding if you have that spiritual hunger if that's been awakened in you by the beauties of nature or the joys of fellowship or the power of good stories or the sweetness of happy memories recognize your spiritual hunger is pointing you to the bread that came down from heaven a third thing that i think this passage pulls out is that jesus oftentimes doesn't meet our needs in the way we expect he multiplies loaves and fishes the people follow him looking for more and he surprises and confuses them by his response you know in essence these crowds are bargaining with jesus what do we have to do to get more of your magic bread what works do you require what do we need to do and i think that's how many of us relate to god we come to him and we want to bargain we want to have a fair exchange i give you this god you give me that uh, we'll make you king you give us magic bread every day that was the, the israelites response my response is oftentimes if you fix this problem i'm having or solve this situation or heal this person that's sick or, or grant me this request that i have I, then i'll follow you that's not how Jesus works. The Bible's filled with people who thought they could bargain with God. Just last week in church, we looked at a bunch of demons who thought they could bargain with Jesus and ended up in a herd of pigs that promptly jumped off a cliff into the sea and drowned. Moses at the burning bush tried everything he could to bargain with God so he wouldn't have to go back to Egypt. I don't know who you are. Who are you? Who am I? I don't want to do it. And finally, the Bible says God got angry with Moses and basically says, get a move on now. <laughs> on the night that Jesus was arrested right before his crucifixion, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, uh, tried to force Jesus' hand, tried to bargain with Jesus to get Jesus to do what he wanted instead of what God wanted Jesus to do. Poor Jonah. I don't want to do what you want me to do. He gets swallowed by a fish. Okay, I'll do what you wanted me to do, but I won't be happy about it. People repent. See, God, I knew you'd forgive them. I'm so mad. Worm eats plant. And finally, God says to Jonah, how dare you? For some of you, the, the thing you need to think about, the thing that's holding you back, that's the thing that, 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 that's really causing that spiritual hunger. And what you think you need isn't what you really need. It's just like more magic bread isn't what these crowds needed. All of us are tempted to, to labor for food that spoils, for things that in the end will let us down and will disappoint us that won't ultimately satisfy it. We try to bargain with God through through prayer, through church attendance, through through giving, through through short-term obedience. We promise to do what we think he wants us to do if he will do what we want. I wonder what perish, perishable foods you're fixed on that's keeping you from seeing your, your deepest needs. What is faith? How do we get eternal life? Jesus is very clear. When they ask what works God demanded, Jesus says in verse 29, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. In verse 40, he repeats it. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son of God and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. 
There's not some special, unique accomplishment you must have or action you must perform to get eternal life. Jesus doesn't want to bargain with you. He wants you to believe in him. What does it mean? What does that mean to believe in him? And this is where this metaphor of the bread of life really shines. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Notice that parallel there. Whoever comes to me. And the second phrase, whoever believes in me. Coming to Jesus means believing in him. We see that uh, this same, same parallel, kind of parallel in verses 47 and verse 51, when Jesus says, here's how you come to me. He says, the one who believes has eternal life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. That's what faith is. Coming to Jesus for the satisfaction he offers. It's turning away from all the perishable foods that you've sought to satisfy the deepest of hungers and coming to the bread of life to have life eternal and when you do jesus says i'll never cast you out i won't lose you i'll raise you up on that last day and you'll live forever with me but we have a choice and this is the fundamental choice in the passage the crowds were seeking jesus they found jesus but not all of them really found him some of them heard what Jesus was offering and chose to walk away. John chapter 6, verse 66 says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And that's a, that's a possibility. That's an option. It is possible for you to hear who Jesus is and what he offers and walk away. And there have been times in, in everyone's life where we felt like walking away. I've had doubts about whether Christianity is true, whether God is a loving God, whether he really cares about me. 21 years ago, my, my brother, younger brother, Tim, passed away, developed a brain tumor and Doctors told us he had six months to a year to live, and nine months later, he, he passed away. And I questioned God. I said, God, how could you, a loving God, take my brother who had done nothing wrong? He was a good guy. He went to church. He, he did all those things. He was Christian. He was following you. And I, and I questioned, and I doubted. But then the words of Peter at the end of this passage really helped me. After some of those disciples had turned away and went back, Jesus turns to the 12 and he asks, these 12 are the closest of his disciples, and he asks them in, in verse 67 through 69, he says, verse 67, he says, you do not want to leave me too, do you? And Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter walked on water the night before. And now he's proclaiming Jesus as God himself. And that's where I've landed as well. When, where else am I going to go? Jesus is real. Christianity explains reality to me. In fact, it explains me to me. It explains why I feel this longing and aching for something great and, and glorious. Why I have a desperate need to be happy and that no experience on earth ever really satisfies. It explains to me why the world is broken and ugly and yet everything in me cries out for goodness and beauty. It explains the, the horror in the world and explains why I find it so horrible and explains how it can be put right. Jesus came down from heaven to satisfy us, to bring us to God, to give us eternal life. These are the words of life. He is the Holy One of God. He is the bread of life, the living bread that came down from heaven. 
so come to him.